so great to be here. Uh, thank you to Peter and Michael Peterson for inviting me to uh, moderate this, this extraordinary panel uh, today on rising interest costs and how it affects uh, the economy. Now, um, just a reminder, I know that many of you were, um, were sending in questions during the last panel, and I uh, encourage you to continue to do that. I have my iPad with me, so whenever a question pops up, I will turn to the panel and ask. Um, and I wanted to start off, uh, obviously everyone knows, I mean, this is a panel that doesn't need any introduction at all, but let me just run through very quickly who is here with me, of course. We have Alan Greenspan, the former Fed chair. Uh, we have a Richard Fisher, who just retired from the Dallas Fed after 10 terrific years there, <laughs> and Larry Lindsay, uh, who is, of course, the former chief of staff uh, and also a uh, former chief economic advisor to Bush and, and, and a longtime veteran here uh, in, in, uh, in the political scene uh, in Washington and also former Fed governor. He and, uh, he and uh, Dr. Greenspan have worked for many years together through some amazing and interesting times in the economy. Uh, so I wanted to kick off, actually, with, uh, with what was pointed out to me, actually, by Michael uh, just back there, um, on page 19 of, the, um, of, this, uh, of this booklet that you have, I thought this was just a great, great chart here that really sort of drives home the point of how important it is to understand and mitigate the interest costs and our, at, in terms of our economic future. I know Richard Fisher uh, also glee, you know, gleamed onto this chart. It basically shows you that if we don't care, take care of our interest costs, Okay, guys, this is a lesson here, so open up your booklets to page 19, okay? Um, by 2066, this is the point. Uh, your interest costs are going to exceed federal revenue, okay? Now, if by 2048 you add on debt, by 2048 it will actually exceed revenues at, on that year. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that, look, we need to address this problem. It's a problem that the media hasn't focused on tremendously. It's a problem that these guys are. So I want to ask, uh, maybe I'll start with Larry Lindsay here, because I always start first here. But you know, I'm going to do something a little bit different this time. Uh, Larry, tell me, when you see a chart like that, and you see that trajectory, what do you do? How do you mitigate this? Well, the, right now, we're artificially mitigating it through uh, Fed purchases of bonds. Uh, that is not a sustainable proposition. And so one of the things we should all be concerned about is not only are we going to have to pay interest on that debt, but ultimately the Fed is going to have to dump the debt it now has onto the market. So there's going to be a huge amount of supply coming on, which is going to push up interest rates. And we talk about 2060 and 2048 and things like that. Just think about 2025. The next president, if he or she serves two terms, will be submitting the 2025 budget. Now, interest costs, health care costs, and Social Security will be 4.6% of GDP higher under current law than they are now in that budget, if we do nothing. No increases, nothing more generous. That's the equivalent of a 20% across the board tax increase in all taxes. So the top tax rate would have to go from 40 to 48. The Social Security tax rate would have to go from 15.3 to 18.3. The corporate tax rate would have to go from 35 to 42 just to hold things even with what's automatically going to happen. Those are not the kind of taxes the economy can afford. And so taxes are not the solution. In the end, we're going to have to begin to attack the Social Security and health care cost problem. Uh, and that's going to be the ultimate way of holding down the interest cost on the debt. Richard? Well, first, a little context. I went back and looked at what our total debt was as a nation the year that Alan Greenspan was born in ancient Greece. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> 1926, our total debt was 19.6 billion. I was born in 1949, and the total debt of the U.S. government was 253 billion. Now, if you add up the numbers, in terms of what's held by the public and the intergovernmental holdings, we're talking at a number that's pushing 18 trillion. Um, it does not include these unfunded liabilities of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. And also does not include, which I believe it should, 
the ultimate obligation of the so-called agencies, Freddie, Fannie, mm -hmm. and Sally Mae. So it's, we're talking about very big numbers. The real issue is what does interest do, and that chart shows that we're going to get to a point, at some point, whether those numbers are accurate or not, these are economic models, where interest eats up certainly as much as we spend on health care. Mm -hmm. And if you look at CBO's numbers and you project out forward, not too far, interest in health care costs will be well over half of our entire budget. And in Pete's opening letter of the brochure that you have introducing this conference, he points out that interest costs will exceed R&D, education, and very importantly, like Mike Bloomberg lectured us, infrastructure. So we've put ourselves in a horrific position and getting to the Federal Reserve, and I was part of that group, Alan had exited a few years earlier, uh, we had this huge rise while I was at the Fed and the federal debt from 7.7 .7 trillion to its current level of almost 18 trillion. So that's 2.7 times a compound annual growth rate of 11% just over 10 years. This was not on his watch at the Fed, but since he left. Um, we've been taking money out of the market and we have been investing long. So the average maturity in the portfolio that we accumulated with these big bond purchases is closer to the 10 year level. Treasury's been issue short term debt. At some point you have to pay the piper. And uh, the real issue is what happens when interest rates go up? Mm -hmm. The CBO estimates have them just increasing gradually. Well, we've been suppressing the yield curve. Foreign buyers have been helping us suppress the yield curve. And I think this is the ticking time bomb of all. Interest rate costs, and the question is what do we do about it? So. I'm going to let Alan answer what we do about it. Well, I, I want to get to that <laughs> rising interest rate and the cost. But okay, Alan. By the way, are you going to let him rib you like that? I love this man. So <laughs> I, he lets me get away with it. If he stopped, if he stopped ribbing me, I would send him to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, there's a certain unrealism about oh, this type of forecast will never happen. Markets will anticipate well in advance. But we're leaving out a critical issue in that these are relatively fixed interest rates. Once you start down this path, you don't get the four, four and a half, five percent rates. You get much higher rates. Mm. I mean, uh, if you look at any sy system which is similar to this, markets start to anticipate. But we're way underestimating our debt as of now, largely because we are not including what I would call contingent liabilities. And that is the issue of, which is answered by a question, but it's answered really by a question. What is the probability that in today's environment that JP Morgan will be allowed to default? <laughs> the answer is zero or less. Mm -hmm. Now that means that that whole balance sheet is a contingent liability. Now, to be sure, while it's contingent, there's no interest payments. But ultimately, that overhangs the structure because we have committed in so many different ways to guarantee this, that, and the other thing. It's not only, it's not only Fannie and Freddie, but it's a whole series of financial institutions. And regrettably, it's also non-financial institutions I mean, I was very much concerned when we started to guarantee everyone as being too big to fail, but at least it was in the financial area. Mm -hmm. As soon as we moved over into General Motors and to various other non-financial corporations, I said, what is the contingent liability of the United States? Is it definable? Uh, yeah, I can give you a number, but it runs off the edge of the page. <laughs> Uh, it's not a realistic number in the sense it's never going to happen. And I think what we're, what we're with the three of us talking about is the path we are currently on is not going to be easily resolved and mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult. And as uh, Peterson Institute has started, it's been stating right from the beginning, the sooner we get to it, the later, the better. But uh, I see no evidence that we're moving in that direction, largely because uh, the issue of the budget, and very specifically, which I'll get to later, is the issue of entitlements 
which is truly the third rail of American politics. Which is what Larry's discussing off, off as well. Yeah. And uh, essentially, uh, uh, it's not, no, I mean, I look at the increase in uh, entitlement programs, and it turns out that you might think that it's largely expanding under the Demo Democratic administrations. Mm -hmm. No, it expands since 1965 or something like that. Uh, the expansion in the entitlement programs has been greater on average and in absolute amounts in Republican administrations rather than in Democratic administrations. So in both cases, uh, it's the third rail, you touch it, you lose, and no one wants to address this. Now, I mean, we can do everything else, but we well, can solve this with... I, I think it's almost comparable to what we saw with Simpson-Bowles back in 2010, where it seemed like every lawmaker, in principle, agreed with it, but nobody wanted to vote for it. Richard? But here's the bottom line. So we have been talking about debt held by the public and our fiscal deficits and so on. And the accumulation of that is what we call debt held by the public. You have to take that number and multiply it by a factor that's significant, as the chairman just mentioned, for some of these implicit guarantees and then some explicit guarantees. So we're talking about a huge number. Mm -hmm. You have to finance that. How do you finance it? You pay interest on what you borrow. And that really is the focus of this discussion here. I believe, and again, I serve with very wonderful people at the Federal Reserve, starting with Alan and through the chairman of Ben Bernanke and now uh, Chair Yellen. But what we've done is we've taken out the urgency for fiscal policy actors to get their job done by suppressing the cost of interest. They're going to have to face the music at some point. And very tough decisions will have to be made. You cannot count on the central bank to continue to underwrite well, that music is about to end. It, it is starting to right? end, but it's not ending quickly. We're holding the balance sheet where it is by not reinvesting, it, excuse me, by reinvesting the proceeds. Yeah, so, and that's why I don't think we appreciate the urgency. Under President Obama, the OASDI, the Social Security Trust Fund, actually ran cash flow negative for three years. That means we're starting to run down those balances already. We will exhaust the trust fund sometime in the late 2020s. That's not too far from now. 85 or 90 percent of the people in this room will be alive when the Social Security Trust Fund does not have enough money to pay its obligations. So that's an issue we all have to confront. It is coming, it is coming soon, and it is not being discussed. I personally don't think it would be prudent in 2027, or not only not politically possible, but not even economically sensible, to do what the current law says, which is simply cut all Social Security recipients' benefits by 27% across the board, in part because I'll be one of those recipients. <laughs> but um, but, but it, it doesn't make political sense. It really doesn't make, it isn't, it isn't fair. That's why we have to begin now with a gradual phase down. So you do not face that kind of shock. The fact that we're not going to be having an across the board cut means those are as real a source of debt as our bonds. And if you include our unfunded Social Security and Medicare obligations, our debt is actually much closer to 300% of GDP mm -hmm. and not to 100% of GDP. That, by the way, is higher than Greece's debt currently. Now, let me go on from there. The notion that we have a trust fund is nonsense. That trust fund has no meaning whatsoever except for the fact as in all private defined benefit programs, if it runs out of money, you can only pay out the cash flows mm -hmm. that come in, as Larry was pointing out. But the probability that that will happen is not particularly high, like start, let's start with zero and go down. Uh, that means that the trust fund is a meaningless instrument. It has no function, and I think as Larry pointed out, it's exactly the same thing as uh, current expenses. I mean, it's not, it's a discretionary, it's, it's, a, it's a mandatory outlay 
and the existence of the trust fund and all the discussion about when it's going to run out is nonsense. There's no possibility that when it runs out that uh, anything's going to happen except they'll change okay. the law or move some general revenues, which is what they usually do, into, it. into the yeah. trust fund. It's just there's a bunch of bookkeeping stuff that goes on which has no meaning. And we're just avoiding the issue of the fact that we have committed ourselves to pensions which we cannot pay under existing, an existing future. Yeah. I mean, we're getting, uh, it's not like we're getting like Greece, we're getting like Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> which is worse. But imagine the political turmoil if you get to a point where you have to cut payments to those you've promised payments to and instead say, we have to pay interest on the debt. Mm -hmm. And then you can just see the right and the left say, well, who owns our debt? Well, the Chinese, the Japanese, et cetera. I mean, th this is a political train wreck that's about to happen. And we have to somehow but you urgently come to grips with it, which is what this great summit is all about. But you, you, but you know what I would say is that, and I, there's no poll I can, I can point to at this moment, but I think the American public correct me if I'm wrong, we've seen polls, are becoming aware that they can no longer, in their future generations, aware that they can't rely on Social Security. They can't rely on Medicare and Medicaid as much as the prior generation. So I think there's a growing realization among the American voters that this is happening. But that well. suppresses economic growth because they'll consume less in order to save more. Um, it changes the dynamics of our society. Yeah, there's, there's a much deeper fundamental problem here. And it starts off with a fascinating set of data, which basically says, uh, with a high degree of statistical probability, that entitlements, or, or as we call them, government, pay, government social payments to persons, entitlements actually crowd out dollar for dollar gross domestic savings in this economy. Mm -hmm. The data, I've had a lot of st statisticians look at the data, no one can find any, anything wrong with that fact, but they don't believe it. So, I mean, it's difficult to handle that conceptually. But the point at issue is if that is true, which it is, what you find is that as the gross domestic savings rate falls, the gross domestic investment rate falls because the only difference between the gross domestic savings and the gross domestic investment is the amount of savings borrowed from abroad. Mm -hmm. And that is a relatively small amount. It's a so-called current account deficit. But the problem is that if gross investment is going down, what the data also show is obviously that gross non-residential uh, investment, the stock of gross non-residential investment will slow down as indeed it is and that is a direct relationship, has a direct relationship to productivity or output per hour. And what we're now seeing is that output per hour over the last 24 months mm -hmm. has been zero change. Yes, it's stagnated. Standards of living yeah. can only grow if productivity has grown. And what this essentially implies is that the sluggishness that we're seeing in the economy today, and everyone is wondering, where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. Well, it is very simple. We're not getting any productivity growth. And without productivity growth, you get the type of stagnation, the 1.5 to 2% GDP increases, or I mean, I don't believe that the minus 1%, which is what's going to be published for the first quarter, is uh, accurate. I think there is a seasonal problem there, but it's a minor issue. The problem exists that it is very high to, very difficult to envision GNP going up to the 3, 3.5% three rate. And remember that a goodly part of what's in here is based on that assumption. Mm -hmm. And that means that the, rec the receipts, both corporate and individual income tax receipts, for example, are going to come in lower than are being projected. And because a considerable, surprisingly large amount 
of individual income tax receipts are related to the rise in stock prices, when that comes to a halt, not when it goes down, just when it stops, that's going to bring pressure as well so that no one is looking at the receipt side of the budget. And that's where I think a major problem is, which we've never really focused on. Uh, clearly uh, one area, one risk uh, right now to the economic story. Um, okay, I, I want to get straight though to the interest rate question, which is what Richard Fisher brought up um, about the music ending. And I think, you know, we could all um, talk until we're blue in the face on when is the Fed going to raise interest rates? By how much? Is it September? Is it later? Is it sooner? Um, but I'm curious from this panel, um, the impact of rising interest rates, the impact of us beginning to, ti uh, to tighten. So um, on a scale of one to 10, with one being zero impact and 10 being devastating impact, what do you think is going to happen when we start to raise interest rates to the economy? Who wants to take that? Well, <clears throat> it depends a little bit on how it happens. Why? Um, if okay, we... so, so give, me, give me a number first, one to 10. Well, the, the way it's actually gonna happen, it's probably gonna be a seven or an eight. If we were smart about it, it could be a two or a three. Okay. And, and here, here's the difference. We're delaying uh, a normalization of rates way, way beyond what is prudent. We have a monetary policy that's now in place that was adopted for the crisis conditions of 2008 and 2009 that we have this, this summer, we're going to be getting the seventh year of this recovery. It's been a lousy recovery, but it's still the seventh year of a recovery. I mean, that is, that is totally inappropriate. The unemployment rate is essentially at what economists call NIRU. You can argue a tenth of a peer. No one, in, when I went to school, it would be, you'd be laughed out of the classroom if you said the right interest rate when the unemployment rate was five, four, was zero. It was just the most preposterous thing you could imagine. Or that the Fed should have quintupled its balance sheet in five years. You know, we're, we're at the point of absurdity. Maybe it made sense when you had a crisis. It does not make sense now. At some point, what is going to happen, and this gets to my eight or nine cataclysmic number, is that we're going to get a series of bad numbers, a little higher inflation, higher average hourly earnings or whatever, and the market is suddenly going to say, oh my God, they are so far behind the curve that they will never catch up. And the market is going to force an adjustment on the Fed that will be wrenching. That's the cataclysmic outcome. If the Fed were to get a little bit ahead of the curve or even maybe move a little closer to the curve, that's the best we can hope for, we would mitigate that. We would phase into it gradually. And that's why so much is at stake in the monetary policy that we adopt now. So you think, are you think we're closer to the seven or eight scenario? Oh, well, I used to think more highly of what they were going to do. Um, and I've constantly been disappointed. Uh, so I certainly think they could mitigate it. If we, if we do very modest things now, I think the Fed will say, oh, they're really serious. When I talk to my clients, the, they, the Fed has almost no credibility when it comes to a sense that they will be able to stay on top of this ticking monetary bomb. Now. My clients are all making money. They're enjoying the party while it lasts. Nobody's complaining. That's why things are going up. But they also know that it will end. They don't think the Fed is going to take it seriously. And so if you have an institution that's lost credibility in the market, when the bad number comes in, the market is going to take the Fed and the Treasury curve to task in a very painful way. I may be the only Fed FOMC member who would quote Van Morrison <laughs> and his great song, Not Feeling It Anymore. I just want to read you a couple of lyrics. It says, when I was high at the party, everything looked good. I was seeing through rose-colored glasses, not seeing the woods for the trees. I started out a normal operation, but I ended up in doubt. So Larry looks at me. I voted against QE3. There was a reason for it. Um, first of all, we were well along our way, March 2009. The markets had started to take off. They've tripled, as you mentioned, as Alan pointed out enormous sense of revenue, things don't grow to the sky, they don't continue. The real answer to your question is that 
it depends on where it comes from. If it comes from exuberant economic growth, rates will rise. The good news is it's because of a good thing. The bad news is this interest rate overlay that we have that we talked about earlier, rates will go up, the government will be funding more and more in interest payments, and they put themselves in a horrible position. The worst outcome is if rates go up because of one of two things. Either inflationary expectations change because of the policy we've been leading, and we don't get the kind of growth we want, but instead the markets begin to discount inflation, right. rates rise, or because of what Chairman Greenspan mentioned, which is the markets begin to discount what actually is happening in our country, our low productivity, enormous debt burden by the federal authorities, and none of these implicit and explicit guarantees, and rates rise. Even if you look at CBO's numbers, by the way, they're looking at a rate of 4% for interest rates going out forward. But if you parse those numbers, there's one little footnote. If they go back to the rates of the 1980s, God forbid, we're talking about a trillion dollars by 2021 in additional interest burden. So it really depends on how the markets respond. But I think there's a limit to market tolerance here. And this is why I was advocating that they begin to stop the reinvestment of the portfolio, begin to shrink it slowly. My guess is they're going to sit on that portfolio to at least 2027 mm -hmm. and not sell off these securities. They're by further suppressing rates a lot, not letting the market normalize. Right. Further Instead of doing what Larry advocated, which is just gradually letting the market adjust. Um, and otherwise, we could have a spike up in interest rates, and that would be the worst outcome. So if it's driven by economic growth, it's good. Driven by worries about inflationary expectations, should they arise, bad driven by what Chairman Greenspan mentioned, the worst outcome of all. So here's what Larry Summer says uh, recently about this. Uh, and I think he, he wrote this op-ed, I believe, back in February um, in the FT. He says, quote, the Fed could inject much needed confidence in the economy today and minimize future risks by announcing and following a strategy of not raising rates until it sees the whites of inflation's eyes. I, I disagree with that. Once you I see the whites of the eyes of inflation, you're way past in trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, and, yeah. and over 100 years of the Fed waiting to do that, when they did tighten, you drove us into recession. Those are the facts. You anticipate monetary policy has a lag. Anyway, I love Larry, but he's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, you want to Alan's say got something? better perspective. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Larry is a very smart guy. Yes, much smarter than I am. <laughs> Uh, look, the imp implication here is that the Fed can control the interest rate. It can't. Uh, the federal funds rate is already obsolescent. The actual effective rate that the Fed controls is the interest paid on reserve balances. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the moment, uh, I mean, I'm not all that concerned about QE1, 2, and 3. Why? Because nothing has happened in the markets as a consequence, except the fact that it has driven real long-term rates down and therefore price earnings ratios on stocks uh, in all sorts of real estate and uh, jewelry. And I would say, you know, look at what's happening to art prices. Uh, th this, is, this has had a significant effect on asset prices, mm -hmm. but it has had very little effect in the conventional way in which you pump reserves into the, into the banking system. The individual Federal Reserve banks relend it into the market, and that engenders a rise in economic activity. With the 25 basis points that they're paying now for those reserve balances, a J.P. Morgan sits there and looks at the 25 basis points for a sovereign credit with very little in the way of capital requirements associated with it and say, that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> and so that you look at the lending that's going on out there, it's not very impressive. Yeah. And the result of that is that whether we have QE1, 2, or 3 has become irrelevant because the whole stock of assets are sitting on the balance sheets of the Federal Reserve banks and are latent. I mean, in other words, we're just borrowing from each other, but there's nothing going outside the Federal Reserve system. That is going to change at some point, and it is going to change because the pressure on the market is going to rise 
And if the Fed chooses not to raise the 25 basis points, it will start finding its balance sheet shrinking. If it decides that it wants to keep the balance sheet the same, it's got to raise rates. They cannot do both. And I think we learned something from the so-called taper tantrum a while back, how markets are going to respond. There is no conceivable scenario in which it's going to be easy. And I think uh, I'm pleased in the fact that there are very smart people in the Fed who know exactly what the three of us are talking about. It's not as though they're sitting there and saying, oh, that's nonsense. It's not like they're oblivious to this. No, they are, yeah. oh, they are acutely aware, but they're in a very difficult political position. Yeah. Let, let me give you the numbers mm -hmm. on that, just so the audience understands. These excess reserves that are parked in the 12 Federal Reserve balance sheets are two, a little over two and a half trillion. They're being paid, the women and men who make, put those monies there, because it's excess, meaning they're not lending it, are being paid 25 one hundredths of one percent per annum. Hmm. Uh, no, no banker in their right mind, no woman, no man, is satisfied with that over the long term. And this is really the issue. How far do you have to, imagine move, if you had to move it from 25 base points to 4 percent, the disruption that would occur in the marketplace. So the chairman's absolutely right. That's the key thing to look at. We bought all these bonds. When you buy something, you pay for it. We paid for it through depository institutions. They put it back on our balance sheet in excess. To me, uh, that is the real issue. And I think the chairman's right. I just wanted to give you the numbers to put it in proportion. And, and since, since we're in Washington, I, I just want to uh, uh, extend that uh, two ways. If we went from 25 basis points to 4%, we'd be sending the largest banks in America oh. a check for $100 billion a year. Not just America, by the way. Oh, not just America, uh, banks around the world. <laughs> Won't that be politically popular? Um, so uh, that's, it's just not what, we're to, as, as Alan said, this stuff is not going to happen because it can't. Let me take li what I think of as the other Larry's uh, story and explain why we are skeptical. Um, uh, Chairman Greenspan mentioned the word lags. Now, I'm just going to pick a number. I mean, the, the phrase, the official phrase, which gives us a lot of wiggle room, is called long and variable lags. Okay? Let's call it a year. Now, let's play a little game. <clears throat> For monetary policy to actually be tightening, you'd probably have to have the real Fed funds rate be positive. Let's call inflation one and a half. So we're not even going to begin tightening until the Fed funds rate gets to, say, one and three quarters. Now, let's say they started raising in June, and they moved every other meeting. So we got to go seven meetings. Every other meeting would be June, September, December, March, June, September, December. So by December of 2016, we would have our first positive real Fed funds rate. And then the lags kick in, and it takes another year for that to slow the economy. So even if they started moving in June and moved every other meeting, you would not have monetary policy be restraining the economy until December of 2017. Now, put that in the context of the whites of its eyes context. If you wait for the whites of its eyes before you start moving, you've got a two and a half year lag on moving before you begin. So you have two and a half years of real inflation before you actually begin to control it. No, it does not work. It is impractical. And um, that's why we're skeptical. So it's just a matter of calendar math. The, the, the alternative, Larry, is that it'll all happen quicker, which is worse. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Particularly because markets work that way. Right. right, the markets will force us, and that's why I'm in the seven to eight camp. And right, so, but, so is it too late already? Are we almost, are we almost too late? Is, is a recession in the cards here, the, inevitably? The, I don't think we're too late. And I, by the way, I have no idea, I'm no longer on the committee, when they will start the process. I'll tell you this, lean in. Sometime in the next 100 years, we'll raise interest rates. <laughs> um, but... Clearly, this is a huge ship that we're driving. It's a tanker full of explosive fuel, these excess reserves. And when you have a tanker, I was in the Navy, filled with aviation gas, the most explosive fuel we have. 
you start slowing down before your docking point or where you're going to meet with another ship to refuel miles out. And that's the simplest analogy I can give you that illustrates the need to begin the process early. Um, and whether it's June, September, whatever, it should begin at some point because you have this explosive fuel in the tanks of the Federal Reserve Banks. Um, now, Richard, I know there was a great, you're, you're great with one-liners. You've already quoted Van Morrison. You've um, asked us to lean in. But there was a great, there was a great line uh, in a recent article where you said something like, like, my dry cleaner knows more about the economy uh, I can forecast more about the economy than than any of the Fed. <laughs> than I didn't any, say that. What I said was Fed. that his record was my dry cleaner. My dry cleaner is better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> these these micro operators understand what's going on with the economy. They feel the day-to-day -day pressures. And I, the only point I make was, we have to be careful not to get wrapped up in these macroeconomic models. Obviously, they're critical, and the Fed has the best in the system. Yes. But you have to. This is something Alan taught me, by the way, and asked me to do after he left. Listen carefully what people are telling you that are operating small, medium, large businesses, public and private. They see things before it's aggregating the data. Data is history. Data is put into models. And I, the only point was just listen to both very carefully. And but what is your dry cleaner telling you right now? Well, he's telling, telling us that he's gone from a point where he couldn't get money, he can get all the money he wants. He has no idea what his taxes are going to be after 2000, fiscal year 2016. Uh, a business person will tell you they have no idea what the government's going to spend after this patchwork budget that we put together, and that they're being regulated to death. Well, who is responsible for that? Not the central bank, the fiscal authorities, the Congress of the United States. They decide how much money they take from us, how it's going to be distributed in spending, and uh, the Federal Register size, which keeps growing and growing and growing. So I don't hear complaints from any business operators anymore about the cost of money or the availability of money. Okay. The big guys especially have enormous access. They've strengthened their balance sheets. They've borrowed net after taxes, after interest rate deductions for negative rates. Um, it's really a question of, give me some certainty here. Mm. You can't navigate a ship to go back in total fog. You've got to have some clarity, and there's no clarity coming from the fiscal authorities, and that's what they complain about. Uh, let me just add, there's the rest of the world out there. <laughs> And it ain't doing all that well. That's right. I thought the most discouraging statistic or fact of last week is when the Chinese Central Bank, or the, I take it back, the State Council essentially said to the banks, don't foreclose on loans. Right. Now, <laughs> when you don't foreclose on loans, the savings flow is frozen. Yeah. And there is no way to get an economy moving if you don't have, whether it's a communist economy or any economy, Failure. savings has to flow into real physical investment. And the extent that that investment is highly productive is the extent to which your standards of living rise. And what the Chinese example tells me is that they're going to freeze all of those monies into place in essentially losing operations, which are not enhancing their output per hour. And the consequence of that is that you get a fairly significant stagnation. So we don't have the rest of the world out there all of a sudden saying, oh, we're doing far better than the United States, and we will effectively succeed in moving you up, but the exchange rate tells us that that is not the case. Everyone is doing it's worse than we are. Yeah. And so we have no, we, we've got all sorts of problems, which says that the sooner we come to grips with this problem, and we're going to have to come to grips with it, or the markets will do it for us. And that is not going to be a very happy experience. And the longer we wait, the longer we're going to find it's going to be difficult to implement it. And there is a presumption out there that central banks can do as they see fit. I mean, the ECB has got a problem, uh, in many respects, more difficult than ours. Yeah. Because if the Federal Reserve were, were ever to go bankrupt, we have the sovereign credit of the United States standing behind it. 
But who stands behind the ECB? It's got this other monetary transaction which has not been drawn upon, but someday it will be. And the question is, if there is a run on the, on the European Central Bank, I'm not sure where they go. So that when we talk this morning about all of the problems that the United States has, uh, we can match them abroad. And that is not a good message for the United States. Would you say what's going on in Europe is quite underestimated? What's going on with the ECB? I mean, it sounds to me like, you know, we're focused obviously on Greece, but a lot of people are focused on China as a wild card here in the global economy. Are we, are we underestimating? Underestimating the fact that China's going to do better or worse? That they're going to do worse, that the Chinese, that the Chinese yeah, economy I, you know, is the on The Chinese a, have got a, a, they've brought their so-called structural GDP down to a 7% annual rate. But remember that China, unlike almost everybody else, can create whatever GDP it likes. Because if you have a, uh, a state council uh, authorizing a provincial organization, government or whatever, to build 20 apartment buildings or something like that, uh, they will then say to a government-owned bank, finance that. Mm -hmm. So what you have is capital investment financed not by a business which is looking for profit, but for political reasons. That appears in their GDP. And so when they're showing these growth rates of you know, double digit, a goodly part of that stuff is, the re is uh, uh, essentially the, um, deciding to build something and count it. They shouldn't be counting that. But uh, that's what they do, and they're going to, they have a 50% savings rate. Now, that is incredible. It tells you something is very fundamentally wrong. And what is wrong is a goodly part of that savings and investment is essentially state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. basically being financed by state-owned banks directed by the, the state council. And the, you can get any GDP you want. And a goodly part of this is what they're getting. And, they're, and they're, the action of last week tells me that they're in far worse shape than I think. I might have just add quickly, parenthetically, the yuan, the RMB, is now floating. And it means that it, they're not undervalued in the way that they were and in which they can do many wonderful things, so to speak. So that's not good, and that worries me a great deal. I, I used to say uh, that we were the best looking horse in the glue factory, the United <laughs> States economy, uh, because there are these issues elsewhere. I think, deep in my heart, if our fiscal authorities would get on the stick and do the brave things like Mike Bloomberg spoke about, uh, that that analogy is wrong. We would be secretary to Belmont in 1973 winning by 30 lengths because of exactly what Alan spoke about. There is a dynamic of entrepreneurialism and still free enterprise in this society. Mm -hmm. We may have ex extinguished a good deal of it, but it's still there. Look at what we've done in technology, or I know this is controversial, what George Mitchell did with the energy revolution in fracking. We create things out of thin air. And we don't have a state-directed economy to the degree that others do. Yes, so you know, George Mitchell did not get subsidized. What's that? George Mitchell did not get so, subsidized. No, he should be in the statuary hall. He's one of the great heroes of our time. He was not subsidized. But here's the point. If our fiscal authorities would grant to the women and men that run U.S. businesses some clarity so they can plan, businesses' decision-making under conditions of uncertainty. But you can't do it with total uncertainty. So again, we know where monetary policy is, whether you like it or not. We have no idea where fiscal policy is going. So, we know what needs to be done. And we, if we could do that, we would be secretariat. We'd so be if, so far ahead in the track, no one would ever eat. So if you could wave your magic wand and do one thing, what would it be? Have a budget. <laughs> Seriously, Mexico, who we make fun of, has one of the best run governments in North America. They have a declared budget. Their debt as a percentage of GDP is minuscule compared to ours. They don't run deficits more than 2.5%. They're liberalizing their infrastructure. They become an exporting powerhouse. They have a totally independent central bank. 
take 75 percent of their governors of the states and 75 percent of their Senate and Congress to take away that new independence they were given under uh, President Zedillo. Uh, and, it, and they go out and borrow, and here's the great point. They borrowed three 100, they issued three 100-year bonds. They just used a 100-year bond in euros at a 4.4% coupon and it traded for less than 4%. Mexico, smart planning. Borrowing as long as you can at the lowest interest rates in 239 years. We should be doing this. Instead, what we're doing is just rolling stuff over, building our problem, I think, Larry, worse and worse as we go through time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, it always ends this way. If you go back and you look at Rome, or you look at the Ming Dynasty, or you look at Zimbabwe, so or depressing. what have you, <laughs> it always, always, always ends this way. <clears throat> and the question is, you know, how can you delay it? We wait, should, you, wait, wait, we but you should. said it ends this way. No, no. In other words, the, the, the end game we're all talking about here is, is a very unpleasant one. It means that the financial arrangements of, that the state has created are no longer sustainable by society, right? And that, that's, that's how overly indebted societies end, and mm. they move on to a new, a new type of arrangement. So it isn't going to be a pretty change if we get there. And that's why it is so urgent that we act now. It is not just a matter of numbers. It's a matter, really, of political liberty because the government will not voluntarily let itself go out of business. It will use all of its powers. This is, I'm not talking about just our government. Any government will use all of its powers in order to, to fund itself. If I may just comment on something that, that Pete Peterson said, it gives an example of just how out of whack things are. Um, Peterson, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Michael Bloomberg earlier um, in, his, in his speech, he suggested small issue, highway trust fund. Mm -hmm. Let's raise the gas tax and let's end Davis-Bacon. Now, Davis-Bacon, I've been in this town for three decades and I've been engaged in this issue for three decades. The evidence is pretty clear that just that one law raises the cost of building roads and bridges by 20%. Now, let's think about that in terms of investment you're getting a 4% return, let's imagine. That means that that bridge is underwater for five years before you even begin to get a return just because of this one special interest piece of legislation. Our government is riddled with this kind of stuff. So it isn't hard to get the math to work for America to save itself, and that's why I'm optimistic, like my colleagues here, that we could do it. But we've got to get on the wagon and get doing it soon because time is running out. Larry, is Simpson, Simpson Bowles possible to bring back at this stage? Should. Uh, well, see, what's interesting about Simpson Bowles is basically the tax increase part of Simpson Bowles has been enacted, and we never got the entitlement reform. Well, was it so exactly how you're going to get the pro-tax side to sign on to Simpson Bowles when they've already got their piece of the deal is kind of complicated. So we can't complete it in that sense. What, are you going to raise taxes yet again? And mm, that's it, it, part of the problem. Oh, so it's dead. It's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. OK, uh, we have um, one question from the audience from, um, from David uh, to, the, to the panel here. Um, he says, in dollar terms, how underinvested is America in job training, innovation, oh. research, and education. How will rising interest costs impact that, and who will end up paying this deficit? I'm sorry, this is a, a, a bugaboo of mine. The one thing we do not need is more college grads. Last year, the median weekly earnings of every demographic group by education, except for college grads, went up. For college grads, it went down. They are in oversupply. The problem is that our colleges aren't necessarily providing the skills that are needed. So let's be careful when we say education, job training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The best job training programs in the country, the two best, are done by the Army and by McDonald's. And um, mm -hmm. they're basically done for free. Um, and that is the kind of job training we need. We do not need to spend another dime on 
these subsidies that basically go into the pockets of the people who, who do the training and don't provide good results. But we have to admit that our primary and secondary education systems are awful mm -hmm. and are not preparing for the skill sets that we need. At $11,000 per kid. Exactly. So if interest rates go up, again, remember how you finance through school bonds, through municipal right. bonds. Again, it's going to become even more onerous. I think Mike Bloomberg is very brave. He, he takes on the teacher unions. As he said, we spend more time with the adults in the system than the students in the system. So I, I agree on the college graduate side, but we really obviously must do a great deal. We have a horrifically bad primary and secondary school education system. Mm. But the interest burden that, that increases will make it even more difficult to manage. But Richard, not an underfunded one. We spend it's more. It's misdirected. Per, it's misdirected. It's, we need structural reform of our public sector. Yep. We do not need to throw more money at an already inefficient public sector. Yeah, and I think you, you know what we are beginning to see is remember the original shock about America's education occurred back in the so called Tim's period. The people who were undereducated at that point are now entering the labor force. Right. And we're beginning to see the first consequences in which you can split the income distribution in this country by age. And if you watch the cohorts, mm. they usually obviously all go up as they get more experienced. What we're finding now is, yes, they are going up, but the ones who were educated 10, 15 years ago are going up at a much slower pace. And that is a, an in, indication that the quality of the education is not working its way through into effective operating people. I mean, we're about to see the major loss of a very large part of our most productive, the most productive people in our workforce. They're all about to retire from being con contributors into the tax and social security system to being recipients. That's and what's coming in behind them yeah. is a lower quality of uh, education. It's not an issue of education. The education is there, but the education has got to penetrate. And something between the amount of money we pour out for education and what comes out the other end it's got to be changed. Let me give you a number, a basic level. We're over 20,000 truck drivers short in America. Mm. What do you need to be a truck driver? You have to do four function math. If you drive a free delay delivery truck, you're running an inventory. So you have to be able to just put in some stuff into the computer, four function math. Secondly, you have to pass a drug test. Third, you can't have a criminal record that's successive. We cannot match. There is a truck drivers association. There's an association for everything, as you know. But they estimate we'll be 200,000 truck drivers short in another 10 years. How do you move goods? Basic skills. Driverless are... trucks, Richard. Oh, that <laughs> invented by the Japanese that are sold here in the United States. So there, we have a huge skills mismatch. We have a shortage of auditors. We have a shortage of engineers, et cetera. But it goes down to this level that Alan spoke about. We're not preparing people for basic skills like truck driving. What will happen there? I think the market will equi equi equilibrate it. You're going to have to drive up the price of truck drivers. That's an inflationary influence. So again, I do think we have to do a lot with education. Bloomberg has spoken about this. Uh, uh, it's a huge passion of his. Sure. You know, uh, I only have a few seconds here. So um, I, Richard, I'd ask you this question, but I want to ask the other um, panelists this too, um, because we are looking for solutions here, right, to our fiscal, our, fi our coming fiscal crisis. Um, Larry, if you could wave your magic wand, what would you change? What would you, what would you want to make disappear or appear? Okay. Well, I think we need two changes. Uh, the first is we need sensible budget law. The 1974 budget law has led us into this trap. It is a lousy way of doing accounting. It scores a mm -hmm. new spending program for one year, a tax change for 10 years. So think about that. Spending more money only costs really a tenth as much as far as the headlines go. It's leading us down the road, and it has missed up our entitlements problem. Second, on tax reform, I think we've come to the end of the road on income-based taxation. I think we have to move toward um, cash flow-based taxation, 
call it a value-added tax or what have you. And I think the simplest thing we could do is get rid of our current income-based taxes and replace it uh, with VAT. How about you, Dr. Greenspan, if you could change one thing? One thing I would change is to recognize that our productivity, long-term productivity, has slowed down. And it is attributable to the fact that the entitlements, which in 1965 were 4.7% of the GDP, have gone up 10 percentage points. Mm -hmm. Had we kept it at that level, which incidentally was a fairly, everyone thought it was adequate. Had we kept it at that level, our productivity would be far higher today. The average, the average wage would be very significantly higher. Standard of living would be higher. And what we have to do is to think how we are going to shrink that pie back. To me, that is the single most important problem that confronts this country. And unless and until we can bring it back to reality, hopefully not after a crisis, but before, I don't see how we get out of this. Lucy, I want to come back again. The people we elect to office have to lead. They need to listen to what the Peterson Foundation is doing here. This is the sixth annual meeting. They're not getting the message. We need to amplify this foundation. I want to come back and give Pete credit. One of my favorite stories is about the backwoods minister that pulls in a drunken parishioner and wants to teach him a lesson. And he puts a glass of water down and a glass of whiskey. Takes a worm, puts it in the water, and the worm swims around very happy. Lifts the worm, puts it in a glass of whiskey. Swims for a while, sinks to the bottom dead. He says, son, do you get the message? He says, yes, sir, I do. If I drink whiskey, I won't get worms. Now, <laughs> I don't understand. These congresswomen, men, senators are getting the wrong message. We're, we're dying in that whiskey where we should be providing clarity, clarity of budgeting, clarity of planning, and a clear future for our people. And again, it's not monetary policy, it's fiscal policy. I thank the Peterson Foundation for what they do. Yes. OK, on that note, and a great story, um, I want to thank the panel for joining me uh, today. Thank you, Dr. Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, Richard Fisher, and Larry Lindsay. Thank you so much.